started in, uh, in, in Romans here again. And, um, but before we do, let's go ahead and, and go to God in prayer. Father and Lord, we thank you uh, for this time that we have. And I just thank you for each person that's here. Their love for you, their desire to open up your word and to not just um, um, hear it taught, but to bring something to the table um, as we study this together. Father, our, uh, it's our heart's desire to know you better, and we understand that that comes through the study of your word. And so, Father, uh, just pray your blessing upon uh, this service and the service to follow. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 1. You want to turn there. We had been talking about uh, verses 18 through 21. And this, this portion of Romans, from the, the last part of Romans chapter 1, is, is a section of Scripture that we go to quite often because it explains uh, a lot of the condition of man. Oh, in fact, Romans does, both in the sense of before being a believer. Um, in, in other words, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then that of the believer being justified by grace. So Romans is good... Um, in, in, in both situations of understanding. But here in Romans chapter 1, we see this last portion, especially verses 18 through 21, we see how God's power was known. And we talked about uh, a number of different things. We talked about the fact of God's wrath, and we talked about different types of God's wrath. How in this portion of Scripture, he's talking about this idea of abandoning. And, and that sounds like a harsh word. And it's probably the word I chose because I couldn't think of a better word. You might think of a better word to use in this situation. Um, we, we see him describing the idea that he left them to themselves is what he's doing. They made a choice, and God has left them to that situation. God doesn't force people to choose him. That's not the kind of God that we serve. And, and I know that sometimes man wants that cop-out. They, they want... Like almost everybody else, they, they don't want to be accountable. So they don't even want to be accountable for choosing God. Well, if God's really there, then he should make me choose him. Therefore, I'm not accountable to him. I'm, I, I'm not guilty before a God that, you know, didn't make me, you know, choose him. Uh, and ultimately, that's what a lot of people are saying. But that's not how God works. God does not make you choose him. He wants you to choose him. That's what he wants from us. Uh, I've said it before that he wants one thing from us. He wants faith. The rest of the things he wants for us. He understands that left to your own self, not good. Following his way, good. Sometimes it might not seem the fun way. You know, the world thinks that the, you know, the, the way that they choose things, you know, most in society today, whether it's teenagers or even adults, um, you know, living a life of promiscuity seems like fun until you got to pay the consequences for it, right? You know, sometimes people, they want to have that party mentality. I've been there. I, I wasn't a believer until I was 29 years old. So uh, I didn't as exactly make great decisions uh, before then. And so the world seems to think that, you know, that God wants to keep us from fun, when in fact what God wants, wants to keep us from is the effects that come from sin, because sin always produces bad things. It may be delayed. It may take a long time for, for it to rear its ugly head, but it's going to. God knows that, and he wants that for us. But at the same time, he's not going to force us to choose him. And what we're seeing here at the end of, end, of, end of Romans 1 is a description of why God allowed man to have what he wanted, but then had a plan of redemption to woo man back to himself. Without clubbing him on the head, it was, this, it was an opportunity for salvation. It was a way in which he's going to show in the future, as Ephesians talks about, he's going to show us in the future the exceeding riches of his grace toward us who believe. That day is coming, which even today, which we don't even fully grasp on this side of heaven. Do you realize that? Do you realize that one of the things that you're going to get when you get to heaven is a better realization of how much God loves you? I believe that. 
I believe that when we get to heaven and we see the exceeding riches of his grace towards us, that we're going to be in awe. We're going to be in wonder. So many people think that when they go to heaven that it's going to be about a family reunion. I want to see my son that's, that's already there. I want to see my mom that's already there. But I'm not too convinced that when I get there, that's going to be what's on my mind. You ever think of that? When you get to heaven, is, do you really think your lost loved one is going to be what's on your mind, or do you think it's going to be Christ himself? I mean, it just, uh, I think that when we think of these deeper things, but, but knowing how the character of God, what he's doing here in Romans chapter 1, is, is this idea of allowing man to choose for himself. And we looked at verse 24. Look at Romans 1, verse 24. It says, wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness. Look at verse 26. He says, for this cause God gave them up. Um, and, and he continues to say it in verse 28. And we looked at Psalm 81. And we looked at Hosea chapter 4. And it's this idea of God allows man to choose the direction he's going to go. And he provides a path. And, and that's what we have to understand. That's what's going on here in Ro- the end of Romans chapter 1. Any questions on that or comments? Oh, goodness. Can't live without this. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. The other thing I want to I <laughs> point out that this Romans chapter 1 tells us is that which... Uh, may be known of God was it hidden no God says it was shown to all of mankind all of mankind understands that there is a God as much as you may think that somebody doesn't really believe that there is a God in fact in fact you can't even logically not believe in something you know what I'm saying in other words you have to actually believe the opposite you cannot I don't believe in stop signs, or I, I don't believe in it. What you actually have to do is I have to believe that there is no such thing. And so you can't even have that negative aspect of it. People who say that there is no God, what they do is they choose to believe there is no God. God has clearly made it clearly known that there is a God. And this, these, these verses here are talking about that to us. Let's read, read verses 18 through 21 again. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. And so we see here God has showed it unto man. One, that he exists. That there is a Godhead. His deity, his Godhead, his power as creator is made known unto all. Look at Psalms with me. Look look at Psalm. Look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19, 1 and 2. It says, The heavens declare, in other words, The heavens make it known, the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. Isaiah chapter 40, turn with me there. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 9 it says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up unto the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that brings good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength, lift, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his life, flock like a shepherd. He shall gather, gather his lambs with an arm 
and carry them with his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in, a, in scales and the hills in a balance who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor has taught him with whom he took counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding behold the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as small dusts of the balance behold he takes up the isles of a very little thing and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering all nations before him are as nothing and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity to whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare unto him a workman melts at a graven image and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold and cast silver chains he that is so impoverished he hath no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot he seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved verse 21 have you not known have you not heard has it not been told you from the beginning have you not understood from the foundations of the earth it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are his grasshoppers it stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in that brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth and he shall also blow upon them and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as a stubble. To whom then... Will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Now, just as a pausing for a moment, who is the Holy One? Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, the one who's saying this. Who will you liken me? Hmm. Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things that brings out their host by number. He calls them all by names by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, not one fail. You see, this is why Romans 1 can say the heavens declare the glory of God. And they, de th this is, well, it doesn't say that there. It says it in Psalms. But it's, it, this is why it talks about the fact that, that his power is made known. Like it says here at this end of this, look up. Look up is what we all we need to do. And so I think as the scriptures say, um, whenever it says that which may be known of God is made manifest. In other words, his Godhead, his deity, his power, he's the creator. All of these things are clearly seen and obvious to any who would simply look up. Only willingly ignorant people deny that something comes from, doesn't come from someone. Let me say that in a different way. Probably a way that makes more sense. If you think that something can come from nothing, you are a fool. It doesn't work that way. Go try a science experiment and tell me whenever you can do it because you aren't going to do it. Go find me an example in, in the world that something doesn't come from someone and you're not going to find it. This phone has a creator. This book has a publisher. Everything that you look around has something that made it. The world is no different. But yet the people in Romans here um, that, that God is talking about wanted to deny God his glory wanted to deny that he was truly God Reggie 
effects and law of uh, scientific law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Nothing exists without somebody doing it. Yep, there's a, and there's a, there's a lot of them. As a matter of fact, the very first law, turn to Psalm 14. When you get into the law of biogenesis and the idea of, of how, and a lot of evolutionists don't even want to get into that. They, they don't want to start with where does life come from because they can't get around that. And so they want to start with, they want to have the luxury of being able to start already with life and that it can evolve from there because they know that they can't really uh, make that leap into everything comes from nothing. There has to be something for it to come from. And, and, and so they, they want to they wanna get around that. Look at Psalm, four, Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The fool literally has, has said, and, and, and you can classify somebody who says that there is no God as a fool. That is the, defi that is the biblical definition of a fool. Sometimes that's our friends. Sometimes that's our co-workers. Sometimes that's our parents. Sometimes that's our children. Um, but keep in mind that that's what this is. You can have PhDs out the wazoo. You can have written 30 books. You could have started Amazon. You could have started Facebook. You could have started everything. But if you say there is no God, you're a fool before the eyes of God. And that's what Scripture teaches us here, is that you are a fool. And this is what Romans here is telling us. Um, it also tells us that they're without excuse because they suppress their knowledge of God. Go back there to Romans 1. They, yes. No, I was uh, just going to say, I've taught, and this really reinforces this, but, um, you know, back in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, you know, man makes, God creates, and only God can create something from nothing. Sure. And, I mean, that's precisely uh, the, the verses you're, you're saying. But, I mean, right. that's, uh, you know, creation... Uh, is exclusively God's. And I'd have to, I don't know if I can remember my Hebrew, which the only reason I know Hebrew is from studying Scripture. It's not like I know Hebrew, but the word there for create is Baha. Does that sound right? Right. Is that what it is? Yeah. And so, yeah, only God creates like that. There is no, you know, idea that man can create out of nothing. Only God does that. That's what separates him. And this is where John, what, is, what, is, what does John say, say when he's talking about the Lord Jesus? It's one of my favorite passages in scriptures, John 1.1 1, 1 through 1.14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. And it goes on that nothing was made that was not made by him. Now you combine John 1 to Genesis chapter 1, and you see that it was Jesus that spoke creation into existence and to, and to imagine the humility and the scorn that he took on our behalf then we can begin to I think really realize see it's whenever you put all these pieces together it's whenever you put all these pieces together that the God who could speak it into existence was also willing to do what he did so it's a good point there Tim uh, Romans 1 again it says uh, verse 19 because that which may be known of God um, is manifest in them for God has showed it in them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal God, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so we have to understand that that when it comes to the world today, we we have a we have a tendency to think that God somehow owes each generation some sort of a magic act to prove that he's there. And, and to you, may, you may think that, that sounds silly, but there are a lot of people out there, and I'm sure you've seen it, that, you know, if God is real, then he needs to show me. No, he doesn't owe to show you anything. Matter of fact, anytime you think God owes, you've missed the point. God doesn't owe anyone, Kevin. 
you know where it says here that every man knows and God's put it in him and you know that the verse comes to me is that where it says that God has given every man a measure of faith you know and then and then they deny the faith mm -hmm. is the way to but you know because it says that they're without it you know and well I, what do we all got to figure this out on our own or to, you know it's just in you to know that and I don't know if that's the measure of faith you know and whatever you have to you have to choose to deny God. You can talk to the smallest child, and they're going to have the understanding that. I mean, obviously, we're not talking about an infant here, but but, but a child understands very early on the idea that something comes from somewhere. It just doesn't you know come out of the thin blue thin blue air, and so you have to choose to reject your knowledge of God, and that's what this is talking about. You have to be willingly ignorant. In other words, I choose to be dumb. And, and that's really what it's saying. I choose to reject the truth. And, and we have to remember that that's really what's going on. And the other thing is, is that um, they chose to suppress their knowledge of God for a reason, didn't they? It wasn't just that they didn't want to know about God. Man doesn't do it like that. Man does it because he has an ulterior motive. He doesn't want to be accountable to the real God, and also he wants to choose to serve false gods. You know, the, the you know, the one that they can mold and shape. You know, the one that you know, the men in, in back in you know biblical times, they they loved to have gods that loved to have um, um, temporal prostitutes and sexual gods and all of these kind of. Gods that, that were in favor of fornication and all these kind of lusts of the flesh and all of these kind of things. Um, man wanted to create gods that they wanted. And, and so uh, they choose to, to be accountable to a God uh, because, one, they don't want to be accountable to God and they, they decide that they want to make up a God of their own choosing. But God, according to this, holds people accountable for denying what he has shown through creation. Keep in mind, that's what this is also talking about. He holds people accountable for denying what he has shown through creation. This is why evolution, creation situation is, is a big deal. Christians should not cave on the idea of, of evolution. We should not cave on the idea of a young earth, in my opinion. To, to, to cave to the idea of evolution, I mean, God started with telling us how he made the world. Are we supposed to just say, you know, we're, we're going to ignore that? Well, this is what God says in Romans 1 is, is where they wouldn't acknowledge him, his God, his power, all the way back for, when it comes to the creation of how important that is. We shouldn't say, well, for the sake of unity, we should just not talk about that subject. I'm sorry. I don't agree with that one bit. I don't believe that's, that's scriptural one bit. God's going to hold people accountable, and there are no excuses. You don't, get to, you don't get to have an excuse that I didn't know that there was a God. It doesn't work that way. Because they did not glorify God when they knew God. It says he gives them up. That's what it says. The decline of man results in God allowing them to continue in the path they chose. They chose to reject God. God allows them. And so what you really see here in Romans 1 is also a story of the decline of man. How is it that we got, we think, you know, we go on, Val and I went on a cruise, when was that, three years ago? Yeah, 2017, we went on a cruise. And you, do, you can go on these tours of, of, of these different ruins, whether it's the Mayan or the Aztecs, or you can go, I guess if you go to Egypt, you can see the pyramids and you can see all these things. Do you realize that all of those things are idol worship of people who rejected the God? All of those things that we think are really neat and interesting, and I think they're neat and interesting too, don't get me wrong, but do you realize they're a testimony of Romans 1? They're a testimony of man rejecting God. And that's what they really are. It's a witness of, God, of, of man rejecting God. Yeah. You know, it says that the invisible things of God are clearly seen by us. You 
you know, the only thing I can think of is the wind or, you know, oxygen. Or, but do you think he's taking us into like a, a spiritual place? You mean the things of God clearly seen? Yeah, the invisible things of God. I think it's the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. I think it's the star. I think it's the sun. I think it's the moon. I think it's the atmosphere, the blue sky. I think it's the beauty of a flower. I think, I think all of these things declare. Um, but when it talks about the heavens declare the glory of God, I think it's, it's ultimately talking about those things that we see in the heaven. But I also think it has to do with the heavens declare it. And so I think that there's a, a twofold, per, twofold meaning here. In other words, when you look up into the heavens, which is why we just read in, in, in Psalm there, um, and we looked at Isaiah chapter 40, where it says specifically, look up. What do you see? And what, what do we see? We see the stars. We, and so I think that there's that, but I also think that, that what we see from there is also an idea that the God, when it says the heavens declare it, it's in other words, God is not hiding his glory from anyone. He doesn't have it masked. He's declaring it. He's making it widely known to all who really want to know the truth. But man chose not to. Yes, it seems like the invisible. Like it says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, I don't think it's looking at streets of gold and everything, you know. Because if you look up into the stars and you see them, you, you see these things. You know, I'm just thinking it's an invisible. Mm -hmm. And I'm to me, it, that must be kind of like a spiritual inner man kind of a thing or a place you actually go and uh, enter into. And, you know. Sure, yeah. Well, it says invisible things, but then it says that they are clearly seen, having been understood. And so uh, I, I think we have to understand that they're not invisible. In other words, they're they're inability to see. And, and I think that the whole point that it's being made here is that no one has an excuse. So there, there's this testimony that's being referred to here is something that's been made known to everyone. It's not just like where scripture talks about scripture is you need to be a believer to be able to discern the, the scriptures because you need to be a believer for that to be able to truly understand it. But this thing here talks about the invisible things are clearly seen. What does it say? From the foundation... For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So, that would be all of us. Yeah. If you read it, though, what he's saying, and, and it agrees with what you're saying, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Mm -hmm. Those are the invisible things of him that's talking about. You can see that through the creation. Through the creation. Right. Yeah which is what, what we were talking about Isaiah 40 and Psalm 14 and Psalm 19 and stuff, yeah. Good point, though. Yeah. We're talking about the heaven that declared glory of God. When I get my family up north or friends, there's two things that will get even an atheist talking about God. And looking up at the stars, and they'll say to me, do you think we're alone? <laughs> and, well, what, a, what an opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I had a telescope once that I had, my daughter and I had built a 10 inch diameter. And the kids in the neighborhood used to come over when I lived at the Royal Oak in Michigan and look through there and they could look down into the, the, the craters of the moon and the, see, the, see the mountains. And then, how did they get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is that we, we need to understand that um, if, if you're not seeing what's around you and wondering and, 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 and marveled by it and, and wondering where it came from. Um, life can get busy, I understand it. Um, but you, have to, you have to be, again, willingly ignorant not to say, wait a minute, how in the world can that just be there? How, how can that just be there? You know, so all of a sudden you get home. Let's say you walk home today. And on your front door is a briefcase with a million dollars. You're probably going to wonder how that got there. And who's going to be coming to get it from you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and keep in mind also, I'd also point out that um, Adam lived 900 something years. You know, most of these 
most of these men of the Bible, you know, interlapped when it comes came time. So, um, and I don't remember the specifics anymore, but I believe it was Noah, Noah and Abraham, um, either overlapped or or were really really close to each other in the, in the sense of overlapping. Um, so, um, Abraham's father or Abraham's father probably could have talked to Noah. Think of that. So I, I don't, you want to know one of the reasons why I think that people lived as long as they did? It was part of, part of that reason. And so um, the other thing I told, told you, tell you about this um, is, is that whenever God judges mankind because they decide not to glorify him, that takes away from our primary purpose. What do you think, when we think about why am I here? Why, why, why are you here? Why did God create in the first place? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. But he, there you go. Glorify. Bingo. Glorify him. Your purpose. This is why it's a scripture says the will of God in your life is to give thanks. Because what do you think that does? That gives him glory. Your purpose, all of humanity's purpose is to glorify God. And when you don't do that, you've technically just perverted life itself. We talked about what the word perverted means. It was to take something and use it for another purpose. We talked about when it comes to it comes to sex, whenever it comes to anything. You've literally, when you've decided not to glorify God, you've perverted your own existence. Look at First Chronicles with me. First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16. Start in verse 24. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the earth. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This is why sometimes whenever I pray, it hits me to, to, to just pray. He deserves glory and honor, not simply because he saved us, but because of who he is. Doesn't he? Doesn't he, deserve, doesn't he deserve the praise and the glory, not just because of what he did for us, but because of who he is. And that's what these verses are talking about, is that he deserves glory and praise because of who he is. Our responsibility is to give him praise and glory. Go to Romans 15. Romans chapter 15. Verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our chief purpose, our, our, we were designed, uh, we were created, and one day when we get to heaven, that is exactly what we're going to be doing is, is glorifying God. And so whenever the people chose not to glorify God as God, um, I think that he has the right to judge mankind, don't you? Mm -hmm. I'd say so. If my car decides not to be operable, I can judge you and put you to the junkyard. Mm -hmm. Sounds harsh, but that's exactly, exactly what it is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, and, and Paul here is talking about the idea of, of one being stumbling block and two eating eating meats and certain things. His set his point is, is you know one don't worry about yourself so much, but whatever you do, do it to His glory. You know, and sometimes we we um, we like to. Um, worry about our freedoms and our rights and all of these types of things, the liberties we have. And, and we do. We're told to stand fast in liber- liberty with which we, you know, we have here. But, but ultimately, the, my liberty goes to the wayside when it comes to giving glory to God. That's the purpose. And so when Romans chapter 1, again, um, that's what they weren't doing. And so the will of God is, is for us in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we give thanks Um, which is to acknowledge his grace and his mercy. And then again, the last part of Romans 1 here, it says their foolish heart was darkened. Um, Look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me. Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. So that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with any wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working of in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness in their heart, who being in times past who who being in past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all in cleanness and greediness. And so understanding that there was this time past where people rejected the truth, they didn't want to know the truth, their foolish heart was darkened because they decided not to listen to the truth. Guess what? The increase, or I should say the absence of truth, you're going to find the increase of lies. That's just the way it works. It's the natural order of things. And the people chose to, chose to ignore the truth. Therefore, what happens? Foolish things come into place. So when truth is rejected, it's replaced with darkness. It's replaced with falsehood. That's what Ephesians 4 is talking about here. That's what Romans 1 is talking about. Whenever you, when you ignore the truth, then it's going to be replaced with foolishness and darkness. Which is why when we talk about the authority of Scripture, which we'll be talking about later, whenever you, if you want to know the truth, don't try to find your own way and don't look to your own heart. Because that's not going to be the way to find it. Uh, your truth is going to be found in the Scripture. Um, and just some other parts, parts to, to mention, and we'll move on from this subject here. Uh, Paul describes, um, well, turn to Romans chapter 10. we Look at Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 3. We see the example taking place. What we we saw in Romans chapter 1, how people rejected the truth. Therefore, foolishness uh, thrived. It fed off almost like a bacteria that just eats up and and takes over. The same thing happened in Romans 1. And Paul describes the same thing happened in the nation of Israel. And he describes it here in Romans chapter 10. Starting verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel as they might be saved, for I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's another way of saying not according to truth. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves on the righteousness of God. That's exactly what was going on in Romans chapter 1. Mankind was wanting to reject God and, and the truth of God. And so 
We saw it in Romans 1. We see it in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 11, since we're so close, look at Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 8. It says, according as it written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes they should not see, and ears they should not hear, unto this day. And David says, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. And so when you choose to reject God, you cannot blame God that, you know, you don't understand the truth. And, and to be honest with you, there's a lesson learned in that again when it comes to Christians. No, God's never going to leave you and forsake you. No, God's not going to abandon you. But if you think for a moment that if you choose to follow the way of the world when it comes to maybe it's liberal theology or, or, or maybe it's no theology at all, if, if you begin to abandon the truth, you don't, you don't think there's going to be effects to that? Your salvation's not going to be affected. But your walk's going to be affected, all kinds of things. So, you know, this is why it's always about us submitting to the truth that comes only from God. This is why Jesus says, I am the way, what? The That's right, the truth. And so it's why we talk so much about it. Um, and so that's what's going on there. Any comments or questions on any of that type of stuff? And so just keep in mind with Romans chapter 1, it's describing, as we're going to get, get ready to get into next week, is this descent of man. He's described what they did. They rejected knowing him. And now you're going to see what happens. So I don't know, and you can raise your hand at this. Have you ever been asked the question, well, what about those people who never heard the gospel? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been asked, well, wait a minute, you know, you know that my friend's not a, not a Christian, but they're a good person? Does that mean they're not saved? You ever, you ever had any kind of question to that kind of a thing? Yeah. Well, Romans 1 is describing the descent of man. And so as we, as we look at that, we understand that the world wants to tell us, oh, the world's getting better. You know, we're getting, to, we're getting to be, you know, more loving, more kind. Well, I don't watch much news, but I don't see much a bunch of kindness and loving going on. I can tell you that right now. There's a bunch of wars. There's a bunch of killing. There's a bunch of all kinds of stuff. I don't see the world getting better. So, but Romans 1, as we, we'll get into, is going to be describing all those types of things. Um, and so, all right.